A very good afternoon to all. On behalf of the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations at Manipal Academy of Higher Education, it's my immense pleasure to invite you all for today's distinguished lecture on the state and media in China, propaganda and influence at home and abroad by Mr. Anand Krishnan. And uh, to give the introductory remarks, I would now like to invite our uh, head of the department, Dr. Nam Kishore, to deliver the welcome address. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Amrita. Um, it's my immense pleasure to have uh, Mr. Anand Krishnan, whom most of you follow the Hindu, you must have come across. Uh, it's sort of an insider's view that you always get rather than from people who have been following China. So we've all read his works and it's, it's a great and immense help to us, especially uh, at times when India and China are not having great relationship. Even when things were good, his, his articles used to be remarkably forth looking in the sense they always have had uh, uh, a mark to make or something cut about the others who have been writing about China. Uh, this is the first time Mr. Anand Krishnan is delivering a lecture in the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations. So my special thanks to him and uh, to Dr. Amrita who has coordinated this particular talk. And uh, Mr. Anand Krishnan, the, the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations has been there as a teaching department since 2010. And uh, over a period of time, we, we have a master's program and a PhD program in geopolitics and international relations. Uh, and the topic that we have chosen today, I think on which uh, you'll be deliberating, uh, we have very, very minimal understanding, and especially the way media functions. In fact, it's absolutely different from other parts of the world. Probably something that's very close by or similar to is only North Korea. So we really don't get to know, though there is so much spoken about China, we still don't uh, have I say or we don't have so much of uh, information about how media operates or how things unfold in, in China, especially with the type of things that are happening in recent times, targeting of certain individuals, how is that being reported or many other things that are still mysterious to us. So from that perspective, I think it's going to be a great lecture from you and a great learning experience for all of us gathered here. We have our first year and second year master students apart from the research scholars and faculty uh, at the department. So on behalf of Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, I heartily welcome you. Probably when you are, uh, when, when there's a possibility, you should also physically visit the campus and, and interact with the students and that will be a um, great thing to see here. So once again, welcoming you to the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations. Over to you, Dr. Amrita. Thank you very much, sir, for that welcome address. Uh, as we are aware of that, uh, uh, Mr. Krishnan is uh, a very known person. However, there's much to his credit and which I would like to reflect upon. Uh, and what I'm more uh, like appreciative of is that he's joining us right now from Hong Kong. So this makes a lot of difference. So sitting in China and speaking to us. So a little uh, brief about him. So uh, Anand Krishnan is the China correspondent of the Hindu newspaper and is based in Hong Kong. He's a former visiting fellow at Brookings, India and Asia Global Fellow at the University of Hong Kong. He was previously India Today's China Bureau Chief in Beijing and Beijing correspondent for the Hindu and has reported from China for nine years. He's the author of India's China Challenge, A Journey Through China's Rise and What It Means for India, published by HarperCollins in September 2020. His reporting has taken him to albeit three of China's provinces and regions and uh, focused on India-China relations and China's politics and diplomacy. So he's also the author of one of the best-selling uh, uh, books on India China. So we keep uh, now we welcome Anand to take the stage and reflect upon the subject which is of deep interest to us. Over to you. Thank you so much uh, Amrita for this kind introduction. Um, and so it's it's not the easiest right now to travel between India and Hong Kong and in, in, in the mainland of course still remains sort of blocked. Uh, so what I'm going to do is share you a presentation that I prepared on the topic on the media in China, which I think all of us consume 
uh, in different ways uh, and look at how it works domestically. And I think more interesting perhaps for all of you is what is changing in terms of their external propaganda. Kind of focus on India and China and use the last year's crisis as an example where you kind of saw China quite active in the way they were using social media websites like Twitter and YouTube that are banned in China, but they were kind of using that uh, in terms of external propaganda, which is a new phenomenon. And I think that's something we should be looking at. Yeah, hopefully you should be able to see my screen. If you can, please nod. OK, I can see at least one person nodding. Thank you. Uh, so. I think that uh, what I really wanted to look at was look at my time in China over the last 10 years and try and give you a sense of how the media landscape changed dramatically in the last 10 years, especially with uh, Xi Jinping coming to power in 2012 and 2013, and how that you kind of had a brief period of openness that no longer exists um, and what that means. Uh, and I thought that before coming to the India-China example, maybe it would be useful to try and give you a sense of the lay of the land uh, and what the changes in, social, in the social media landscape in China have been. Uh, the first thing that kind of surprised me uh, when I moved there in 2009 was that uh, believe it or not, the media was was much more was much less controlled than I had imagined. Of course, you had your state media like the People's Daily and the Global Times and the like, but 2008-9 was when this Weibo revolution took off. Um, in 2009, you had uh, Twitter was blocked in China along with YouTube uh, and Facebook uh, because of the protests in Xinjiang, and people had actually shared. Uh, information that led to the protests in July 2009, uh, which was triggered by by the killing of two Uyghurs who were working in a factory uh, in Guangdong, and those images were shared online on social media. So after that, the the Communist Party of China kind of saw it as a threat to its control of information, and you had them block uh, Western social media websites completely, which remained blocked uh, 12 years later. Uh, and instead, you had Chinese alternatives like Weibo. And initially, Weibo uh, in 2009 and 2010 was quite different from what it is today. Uh, it was a quite alive place, not entirely censored uh, for reporters covering China. It was a great resource. You, know, you had all sorts of information being put out in real time. Um, often that information was subsequently censored. But the very fact that uh, it was out and out for a few, even for an hour or two made quite a bit of difference. One of the biggest China stories of the last 10 years, which was the, the Bo Shilai episode, for those of you who remember it, uh, actually began when people on Weibo were live tweeting uh, this sort of dramatic incident where uh, Bo Shilai's right hand man fled to a US consulate and sought refuge there. And people were kind of live tweeting this car chase. And that's how people came to know of the whole scandal, which we might not have known otherwise. Recently, I don't know if you've been reading about the case of the Chinese tennis player, uh, Peng Shuai, who on November 2nd put a message on Weibo saying how uh, she had suffered sexual abuse at the hands of a very senior Chinese Communist Party leader. Now her post was deleted within uh, 34 minutes, but uh, within that time, screenshots had been taken. And now 15 days later, you've had the whole sort of women's tennis association, top tennis players uh, from Naomi Osaka to Djokovic speak out about her case. And this was because of one Weibo message that she put out. But uh, in some ways, this is an exception. And gradually what you've seen is a, a defanging of Weibo and the party kind of coming back and taking control. Um, and it's quite interesting, uh, a study in 2017 by three scholars, Bei Chin, David Stromberg, and Wu Yan Hu, analyzed a data set of more than 13 billion blog posts on Weibo uh, in the 2009 to 2013 period. And what they found was, on the one hand, there was actually as they put it, a shockingly large number of posts on highly sensitive topics. Uh, they cited the example of 
millions of posts uh, from people who were living in Kunming uh, protesting against a chemical plant in 2014, and that actually led to people going to the street uh, and to protest. Uh, there are numerous examples of, of people posting about land conflicts, of corruption and the like, um, even though some topics are off limits, like talking about the central leadership. But what the analysis showed was quite interesting that and in some ways counterintuitive because it kind of shows you how Weibo began to evolve both uh, from from a site where people were actually expressing views to a very useful tool for the Communist Party to monitor what people were saying uh, and in terms of surveillance and control. Uh, what the research found was after especially after she took over uh, in late 2012, you had this huge uh, sort of mushrooming of government affiliated accounts on Weibo. And they found there were more than 600,000 government affiliated accounts, which accounted for about 4% of all posts on political and economic issues. Uh, so actually for the government, it is a threat, but it also increasingly became a tool uh, for gauging public sentiment, for allowing people to vent, and ultimately, they had the technology to ensure that they could all control what people were saying. And more than that, uh, the traditional media is kind of being replaced by social media for what the Communist Party calls guiding public opinion. And if you follow news in China, that's a phrase that you hear about a lot. Uh, and in 2016, as Xi Jinping put it uh, in this very well-known speech about the media, that they needed to very firmly adhere to correct guidance of public opinion. And as he, as he put it memorably, the party should be or is the surname of all media outlets. Um, as, as David Bandursky of the China Media Project has written uh, in, in the origins of this term, guidance of public opinion is not new. And it actually went back to 1989, the Tiananmen protests, uh, when the party was speaking of the need to guide public opinion back then. Uh, and except now it's evolved of millions of internet users and actually guiding public opinion in 2017 was written into Chinese cyberspace regulations as something that all internet service providers, uh, including the private companies, uh, are required to do. Uh, and, and it's their duties to, as they put it, to promote socialist core values and protect a favorable online ecology, and by that they mean favorable to the Communist Party. In fact, there have been examples now of how this has worked uh, in terms of uh, one recent example was with the retailer H and Ad uh, had actually cut ties with a supplier in Xinjiang who had been accused of forced labor, and. Actually, when H&M announced that move, there wasn't much reaction, but six months later, what you saw was the Communist Party Youth League put out a message uh, saying that people needed to mobilize against H&M, and it began this huge uh, sort of outcry in China. People started boycotting their stores, uh, and they were H&M's online stores were deleted from Alibaba. Uh, so it kind of showed you how they could manufacture outrage, manufacture consent when they wanted to. Now, this is as far as uh, domestic media is concerned. Uh, in parallel, you've also had with this tightening at home, you have this more ambitious effort at what the Communist Party calls external propaganda uh, and how they've been spending huge amounts of money to shape the narrative about China outside its borders. Um, the idea was sort of captured in 2013 at this national propaganda and ideology work conference where uh, Xi Jinping came up with this phrase of telling China's story well. Uh, and I put a quote of what he essentially said, which is something for all of you to keep in mind when you read what the Global Times or CCTV uh, or CGTN, as it's now called, are saying. And this is essentially what their task is um, in communicating China's voice well, and that's their job. And this was marked by two things. Um, on the one hand, you had this huge flood of funding uh, for Chinese broadcasters to go abroad. 
CGTN was one example. Um, CCTV was rebranded as CGTN, and now CGTN is available in so many places around the world, including in India, all over Europe, in Africa, in America, in Latin America. And if you think about India, for instance, which has a thriving media landscape, uh, and we really don't have a single global sort of media presence, any channel that's present all over the world or trying to do that, but CGT has been doing that. Uh, you've also had newspapers like China Daily that are taking out paid supplements in newspapers all over the world, including in India. And, uh, and also even more ambitious programs starting two, three years ago, where they were inviting foreign journalists to come and live in China for one year, including from India. The foreign ministry was hosting them and they were getting them to write things about China. Obviously, all of this was to give a favorable image. But this is kind of well known. What is less well known is what's happening on the social media front. Uh, you've had a huge surge in accounts uh, representing Chinese voices on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube. Uh, these include uh, Chinese diplomats, uh, Chinese foreign ministry spokespeople, state media outlets, even provincial governments in China. Um, and according to the Associated Press, there are quite a number, at least 270 Chinese diplomats uh, in more than 120 countries who are tweeting regularly, uh, probably on a par with the number of Indian diplomats, maybe more. Um, and what is also interesting is that some of the activities don't seem to be entirely above board. Uh, by that, what I mean is they've been using uh, techniques to kind of amplify their presence, including by using uh, a, a large number of fake accounts, which gives them an inflated number of followers. And by doing that, it kind of promotes their presence on social media. As the Associated Press put it, they were creating, quote, a fiction of popularity in a way that could distort the algorithms of how social media sites function. And so some of these social media sites such as Twitter and YouTube have kind of responded by labeling official Chinese accounts. If you go to the Twitter account of the Chinese ambassador to India, you will see that it says it's labeled that he's a government official. Or if you go to CGTN on YouTube, you, know, you will see that there's a small sort of disclaimer saying it's government media. But the problem is that's just a fraction. And there are lots of other accounts that are quasi official accounts that aren't being labeled, as you can see here. It's just a small percentage of those that are identified. Um, so they're quite able to put out information. And in some ways, people aren't really sure whether it's official or not. Um, but not everything they've, they've put out has been successful. This was one high profile example of something that backfired, where you had the official spokesperson of the Chinese foreign ministry put out a doctored image. This was created by a Chinese artist showing an Australian soldier with a knife and an Afghan child in his hands. And this caused a huge outcry in Australia. And Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison made a statement saying this was repugnant. And it actually helped accelerate this down, downward slide in China-Australia relations that you're seeing. So this is the kind of image that works well in China, but outside China, it had a very different response. And for me, it was very important in underlining this new tension you're seeing between their compulsions of domestic propaganda and their ambitions of external propaganda, which can be conflicting. And I'll come back to that in a while. Um, so this kind of uh, was what I wanted to kind of foreground uh, the media landscape and how they're using social media before coming to the India-China border conflict of 2020 and how social media kind of played a role uh, in terms of fomenting Chinese nationalist sentiment within China and also in trying to kind of shape opinion in India by putting out, for instance, videos and photographs on Twitter through quasi-official accounts. Now, this is not very new. And in fact, after the Galwan Valley, uh, sorry, after the Doklam crisis in 2017, uh, you actually had this new approach, which the PLA Daily, the official military paper, spoke of fully integrating publicity forces of radio, TV, newspapers, and social media carrying out a high density publicity campaign. And they did that during Doklam, uh, where they put so much information uh, out on social media. And three years later, during the Galwan Valley crisis, they did the same thing after a period of silence. Um, and I think what, what you've seen is the military in China has put out 
on Weibo domestically, a huge number of unofficial accounts called military fans and the like, and they kind of leak images and videos to them. And those then find their way through Chinese social media handles on Twitter. And a story that I reported for the Hindu in 2020 kind of traced some of these social media accounts and actually found that some of the information that the Chinese military unofficial websites were putting on Weibo were actually being picked up from Weibo by Pakistani social media accounts. And some of these Pakistani social media accounts had adopted fake Chinese names and fake Chinese handles, and they were putting all this information out on Twitter to reach an Indian audience. So you actually had this strange situation where China's domestic propaganda was being picked up by Pakistani social media users and spread on uh, spread targeting Indian social media accounts, which was quite a very strange thing that happened last year. And of course, people in India assumed a lot of these were Chinese tweeting it when it was actually Pakistanis who had changed their names on Twitter and Facebook. Um, within China, over the last year, you've seen this very high profile anti-India campaign on social media websites. Um, and going back over the last 18 months, it's interesting to see how this came into being. So as you know, the clash in Galwan Valley happened in June 2020. For eight months, the Chinese side was silent about the clash and the, number, and the casualties it had. It was only in February 2021 that they announced that uh, four Chinese soldiers had been killed and they announced military honors for four of them plus one regimental commander. And the timing of this announcement, uh, you could see they had prepared a, an onslaught, a domestic public opinion campaign. They put out uh, posters like this saying that, you know, the land that I'm standing on is China's. Uh, I will do what it takes to safeguard my country. Uh, they put out uh, videos of the Galwan Valley clash that purported to show Indian soldiers coming in and the Chinese standing their ground. But what it actually did was it left out the context uh, to Chinese uh, sort of uh, people who were watching. Actually, the Chinese had intruded and the Indian soldiers were trying to push them out. But what their propaganda campaign in India, in China said was the Indians were coming in. So it was very, very uh, kind of clever and how they used the video uh, without giving the context. Uh, to put out a certain message that people in China till today believe that India had transgressed. Well, actually, it was the other way around. Um, and what they tried to do was stoke emotions within China and sentiment within China. It's interesting they did this after there was disengagement uh, in Galwan Valley and north and south of Pangong Lake because they were worried about India's positions in Pangong Lake and they were quiet until there was disengagement and then they put out all of these images. Um, there was quite an extraordinary outpouring of, of anger in China. They put out images like this on the left showing the soldiers, you know, bleeding and the like. There was a there was a very and what was interesting was there was a coordinated campaign uh, between traditional media in China and non traditional media in China. So in the daytime, you'd have the PLA Daily or People's Daily put out an article or a statement. And then over the course of the day or the next two days, it would be amplified with images like this on social media. So it was a fusion of using traditional media and non-traditional media. Um, one a campaign on Weibo was to flood the account of the Indian embassy in Beijing with all sorts of messages, angry messages, abusive messages. Uh, there were all sorts of bizarre things going on where Chinese internet users were putting photos of themselves eating beef in a way to kind of uh, hurt uh, sent Indian sentiments. Um, but on the other hand, you also had, while they were doing this, there was also a clampdown of anyone who was questioning the official narrative. Uh, one example was the Chinese investigative journalist Cho Ziming, who had put a message on Weibo saying that the fatalities for China would certainly have been higher than only four. And he also questioned why India had the very next day uh, come out with its uh, casualties, but China took eight months to do so. And Cho Ziming was actually had his Weibo account deleted. He was arrested and he was charged under a new Chinese law that, that sort of uh, gives a, a kind of a big criminal penalty for people who defame martyrs. And actually more than 12 people have been arrested under this new law for questioning what China said about the India-China border conflict. Um, and I think that what uh, is interesting is when some of this propaganda w worked in China, but it, I think that globally it kind of failed. Um, and I think it kind of underscores how things that may work within China don't really work abroad. No one, I think, outside China believes that India started the Galwan Valley clash. 
even though that's what people in China believe. Uh, and obviously, domestic propaganda is the number one priority for the Chinese Communist Party. Shaping global views is important, but I'd say that it's very secondary. Uh, also, as I had mentioned earlier about this tension between what works at home and what doesn't work abroad, you had uh, the Communist Party's uh, youth, uh, the Political and Legal Affairs Commission, put out on on uh, on Weibo this image that was kind of mocking uh, India's response to COVID-19 and putting out a and what you see written there in Chinese is it says uh, comparing uh, China lighting a fire and India lighting a fire, which is a very offensive image, of course. And what was interesting is within China actually brought a lot of disgust among people saying that this has gone too far. Um, and then there was quite a lot of backlash even from Chinese journalists saying that this was really poor messaging and poor propaganda. Uh, and then after that, among the unusual people who criticized this image was the usually hawkish editor in chief of the Global Times. And then funnily enough, there was a backlash to this backlash and they began censoring posts that were that were critical of this image, uh, which is uh, the point that I wanted to underline was, of course, this tension about domestic propaganda and external messaging. Uh, and I think in the Xi era, I think it's very clear that controlling the domestic narrative is the priority. So I think they're increasingly going to find, even if you're spending all this money abroad to tell China's story well, as he put it, when the message at home is of nationalism, of strong China, it's going to be very difficult for them. It's like having two feet in two boats uh, that are sailing in different directions. So it'll be interesting to see how they how they resolve that uh, tension. Um, a final few points that I wanted to leave you with, and I hope uh, I'd, I'd like to spend time uh, in conversation with all of you, is that this is this is a very interesting sort of um, rough framework of how to read media in China. Um, this was something that was put out by the website called Macro Polo, uh, and it, what it does is, is kind of ranks them in in uh, order of authoritativeness, meaning that when something that's put out by the People's Daily or Xinhua, uh, you know that it has a blessing of the party. And below that you have CCTV, which I'd say is perhaps almost on the same level as Xinhua and People's Daily, but occasionally they're given license to tweet things and do things that aren't 100% official. Uh, below that you have the Global Times. Uh, I would put Global Times English at the lowest level because a lot of things in Global Times English aren't in Global Times Chinese. So Global Times English is for an Indian audience or an American audience. So this is kind of a level of, of, of how you read what is credible and what's not. But this is a very traditional way of, of looking at it, I think what's complicated things for all of us who are looking at the Chinese media and trying to make sense of what they're saying is how would you fit social media in this framework? Like the answer is you can't uh, because it kind of transcends all of these uh, in terms of uh, authoritativeness and credibility. You can have images put out by the PLA daily or by a PLA affiliated fans, military fans accounts that are fake just because they, it's kind of psyops. Um, you can have images or information leaked uh, by official media outlets. Uh, so I think it's become like a bit of a minefield. And I think for us, it requires a complete rethink in how we analyze and deal with information coming out. I think for policymakers, there's one additional thing to think about, which is that the Chinese are now using sites like Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, uh, which is based on the fact that, uh, say, whether it's India or the US or England, you have an open media environment. So there's nothing prohibiting them from putting out that information. Uh, but the problem is it's impossible for, say, India or the US or the UK to do the same in China. But India has a Weibo account, but if it puts something that's, that is uh, questioning the Chinese narrative, India's embassy has had posts blocked and censored on WeChat and Weibo. So it's not a two-way street. And that's something for free societies to think about because, you, I mean, by censoring these voices, you're kind of taking something out of the China playbook you don't want to do. But now you're now at kind of this disadvantage where uh, Chinese accounts are kind of going rampant, putting out stuff on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, but you're unable to respond and uh, do the same thing in terms of reaching out to Chinese audiences, which is something for us to think about. Um, I think I will kind of end on that note, and I hope we will have more time for a, for a Q&A. And, &A and um, I encourage all of you, if you have any questions or things you'd like to ask, I think I would stop there and I hope I was audible and this made somewhat sense.
Uh, thank you so much for that insightful session. And now we'll open up the floor for the Q&A. Uh, hi, sir. I'm Sri I'm a uh, second year student. So thank you for the lecture. It was very insightful. So I have three questions, sir. So the uh, first one you kind of addressed towards the ending. But uh, uh, my question is, like, uh, is there a need for reciprocity towards China when it does not allow like other voices to be heard in China while it, uh, it takes over all the social media in which is possible? They take over Facebook, they take over Twitter, and uh, they spread all this kind of malicious content and they are afraid to do so. But when it comes to China, they block all the others, uh, like all these websites in China and do not allow our voices to be heard there. So, do we need uh, to allow that kind of reciprocity to China? That's my first question. And second question is that, uh, like few months back, I can see that uh, one of the sites we forgot which, which one or that, but it had more traction than it had more traction or reach than, say, Reuters. Reuters, which is one of the most respectful, uh, respected international media. Uh, this is about reach. Uh, I don't know about acceptance. So, can you please throw some light on that? And uh, thirdly, I'd like to know about the challenges faced by journalists like you. We know that uh, domestic journalists in China are of course more friendly. But how about foreign journalists like you in China who are uh, like, uh, reporting contents which might be like you know, which may affect the bandwidth? So these are my three questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for that. Thank you so much for the question. Um, I will start with the th with the last question first because that's something that I think about a lot. Um, I mean, there's a, the reason why that I'm sitting in Hong Kong, for example, is that I haven't been given a visa to go to Beijing for two years. So I so I kind of so we applied for a visa in December 2019, and uh, the fact that I mean that I can't that I haven't been able to go back and I'm in Hong Kong gives you an example of how difficult it is. Uh, for foreign reporters to be in the mainland. I think Hong Kong is, is still much better than the mainland, even though last year after Hong Kong passed this national security law, I think that for domestic journalists in Hong Kong, things have become a lot harder. Uh, they've stopped reporting on things they were reporting on two years ago, such as the protests. But Hong Kong at least is still allowing foreign media. So there's lots of foreign journalists like myself who are in Hong Kong because we're not allowed to to be in Beijing or Shanghai, and that's that's an example of uh, and obviously that makes it harder to report. Uh, and I think the other difficult thing is even if you're in Beijing or Shanghai, it's become harder for Chinese people to reach out and engage with uh, foreign journalists because the costs for them are too high. Uh, when I first moved there like 10 years ago, I was actually quite shocked by how people were really open. They were willing to share their stories with you. And I think that now that really changed and I think there's been like an effort by the, the government in China to portray foreign journalists as being anti-China. Um, and I mean, I won't compare what's happening in India and China, but I, I see some of those trends in India as well re recently where you assume that New York Times or whatever, the minute they say anything about India, you think they have an agenda, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that's what people in China believe about, uh, about in Indian media and American media and UK media. And so for people, it's really difficult to 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 talk to you. Uh, but having said that, I think there's still a huge value of being in, on the ground because even if people can't talk to you, uh, there are people like academics or lawyers or activists who will chat with you and give you pointers and, and give you a sense of what's happening on the ground. Uh, and um, I think as far as Indian media is concerned, uh, the problem now there's obviously a visa problem post COVID. But if you look at the last 10 years, the problem was not China disallowing people, but the problem was the Indian media not caring enough to have people there on the ground. So uh, when I was there, there were only four Indian reporters in China, which was like from uh, I was with India today. There were also people from the Hindu and Hindustan Times and Times of India. And there was no television, a permanent sort of television journalist based on the ground, even though television media covers China so much. And they're quite happy in having people in their studios in India speak about it without wanting to put the resources and have people on the ground there, which I think isn't a great situation. Uh, now, of course, it's more and more difficult to go because of the Chinese government making it difficult for journalists to go. But I think be, having being on the ground is so important to trying and understanding what's happening in China. But uh, but but as your question hinted, it's it's becoming more and more difficult. Uh, uh, and I, I'm speaking about foreign journalists here, but Chinese journalists, it's much, much, much more difficult where 
Um, one point that I wanted to make in the presentation and I didn't is a question that I get asked a lot is how do they enforce censorship in such a huge country? And the answer is it's because of self-censorship that it's because people know what they can say and what they can't say. And the cost of and the cost of saying something are so high that it's self-censorship that that really keeps the whole system in check. And self-censorship in, in some ways is dangerous. It can happen in any society, I think, when people start sort of uh, um, limiting what they say. But obviously with China, it's, it is becoming more and more difficult. On your other question, um, I think that on terms of, I, I think it's an interesting question where reach doesn't, or, and how much they spend doesn't necessarily mean influence, where they may be spending huge money in buying supplements in Indian newspapers or, or uh, on in, in Western newspapers. But I frankly, it's, I, I think a study needs to be done um, and, and maybe, Maybe some of you can do that in terms of looking at Indian media consumers. Uh, how do they react to things that are uh, how they are covered? Suppose a CGTN video pops up on YouTube. Uh, the other day, I was in Chennai and I was uh, and I was on YouTube and looking into stuff on on COVID-19 and the Wuhan lab and those origins. And I was actually shocked to see that so many of the results on on YouTube was stuff that was coming out from Xinhua and CGTN about how this lab thing is a myth and how the US uh, US labs need to be investigated. And there were so many of these links actually, and I was in Chennai. It's not that I was in Hong Kong. And um, so I, I was quite taken aback by that. But how, whether people are believing that or not, I think that's that's a different, uh, difficult question to answer. My own personal view is, I don't think the quality of the propaganda is all that great. I think some of the stuff increasingly is designed, even if it's done in English, it's often has Chinese subtitles. And the reason is I think, they they are doing this for their own domestic audience and kind and trying to show the domestic audience that their media is international that it has global reach. But I find that a lot of the videos can be a little crude, and I don't know if they play really well outside of China. So I don't know how the, all the money they're spending is really translating into influence. The one point that I will add is I think that uh, the 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 unanswered question is if you look at Southeast Asia, Africa, Latin America, Eastern Europe. Uh, maybe these things might not work in India or uh, in the West, but um, I, I think that I've heard from African journalists, for example, the kind of uh, um, money they're investing. Uh, in, there are some countries in Africa where the only English language channel you get, you don't get BBC and CNN, but you get CGTN. So I, I think that needs to be looked at. Uh, we tend to focus on India and the West, but if you look at other, uh, other places, I think they're more successful. Uh, especially if you look at Eastern Europe and, and Africa and Latin America as well. Uh, but I think it's something that should be looked at. And I think we make the mistake of saying that if they invest $10 billion, it means they are getting influence, but that's not necessarily the case. It's about how they spend their money and, and how they're actually doing that kind of propaganda. Uh, India is a good example where I think that public opinion, every survey that I've seen has shown uh, last year, public views on China are deteriorating. Uh, and in fact, that's happening in many countries. Which is uh, which is a counterpoint to the fact that their spending on external publicity is going up, but public perceptions of China and most surveys are going down. Uh, so, so that's something to think about. And I think there was one more question at, at the front that I might have missed. Uh, yes, sir. I think that's the debate that's happening on many levels now. Uh, I know that's happening in India. I know it's happening in the US as well. Uh, reciprocity in terms of for one number of journalists. So you have say 12 Chinese journalists in India. Right now you have two Indian reporters in China. Um, so how do you deal with that? Um, but then I think the uh, I think reciprocity is really tricky because of my own personal view is you don't want to in, in trying to respond to China. Do you want to become a China is something that you have to think about. Um, I know that for for example, for, like for instance, India banned WeChat, and I I and I mean I, I reported about it, but I don't think I am not in great favor of India banning WeChat and TikTok, which we did. Uh, I think we tried to do it as an economic coercive measure, but I don't think it really worked in terms of if you look at what's happening on the boundary. But uh, I thought that uh, from my own personal point of view, I don't use TikTok. I think I'm too old for it, but I know a lot of people who use TikTok. And I don't think it's a threat to national security, frankly speaking. Uh, and uh, it's, um, I, I mean, WeChat and TikTok have been in India for many years now. 
And I found it very difficult to believe that the Indian government coincidentally just decided or discovered that there was a national security threat and banned more than 200 Chinese apps. So my own personal view is I don't think it's a great approach for us to go down their road of banning and censoring and turning off the internet in places like they've done in Xinjiang and we've done from time to time. And Kashmir, I think that's the wrong thing to do. And I think that ultimately, uh, my own, maybe it's naive, but my own personal view is the, the only way you really counter propaganda is if you actually, in truth, have a good story to tell. It's not that you can you can say anything and if it's completely divorced from reality, people are not going to believe it. Um, so, uh, but I think it's a, I think people are debating that more and more. Uh, right now, I think one approach has been to label these accounts as official accounts. I think that's a way to go. Uh, uh, for instance, I think newspapers should do the same, where I think if they carry advertisements or supplements, they should make it extremely clear to readers that this is an advertisement and it's not uh, their own content. So I would say find like a via media where you are making it very clear to people that the information is paid for by the Chinese authorities. And I think most Indian readers, I believe, if they knew that the source of information was being paid for by Chinese authorities, they might take it with a pinch of salt. The problem is it's not always clear to people and they don't look at disclaimers. So on YouTube, the next video may pop up showing a, a Chinese video saying that the, the COVID-19 came from America. And how many people are actually going to look at who put the post of the video and look below that and it says this is a government affiliated account. Not everyone is going to do that. So I think it's about finding a more smart way to kind of identify the source of information. I would think is a better way to go rather than just banning it outright. Hello, sir. My name is Madhika. I'm a senior actually here. Can you hear me? Um, I actually had a question about propaganda. We know how it's spread or uh, it was on this white world. Uh, but I want to know, like, how was it designed? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the question. I did hear you say that what happens when propaganda doesn't work out, but could you just repeat the first part of the question and slightly loudly, please? How is propaganda designed? What makes it work? And what happens to propaganda that doesn't work? Out? Sure. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I would guess it's similar to anywhere, including in India, where I think right now the way it works in China, it seems to be where they're trying to, it seems to be more quantity than quality, where they're throw, putting out lots of stuff and seeing what sticks and what doesn't. Um, so in terms of their own mechanism to see what works, uh, I think one of the interesting thing is I don't think, uh, I think one of the reasons why Chinese propaganda isn't so successful is because I think it's in many ways it's very bureaucratic where people are told you produce. I've heard this from people who work in Chinese state media where uh, oftentimes they write things to, appear, to go viral within China rather than go vi viral abroad. They are more interested in obviously getting a high profile in their own country, whether it's what they put on Weibo or what they write. So I think it goes back to the point that I made of this mismatch of what works at home doesn't work abroad. Uh, and I frankly also think that some of the people in charge of propaganda in China who are Communist Party officials or bureaucrats don't really often have a great sense of how international news is consumed uh, or what a reader or a watcher in India may think or in, in Singapore may think or elsewhere. Uh, I, I think it's improving. Uh, if you look at some of the stuff they put now versus two three years ago, it's getting more slick. Um, I think that domestic propaganda has improved in leaps and bounds. 10, 15 years ago, Chinese friends of mine would kind of laugh at uh, official propaganda, but now uh, I've seen people share on WeChat uh, videos that the, recently there's a PLA Air Force recruitment video that went viral that showed uh, a father who's a pilot being separated from his daughter, etc. And people were really moved. So the domestic propaganda has gotten a lot more efficient and slick. Uh, but I think their external propaganda has lagged behind and they still need to resolve this tension of when you're portraying yourself at home as being a strong power who can do what it wants uh, and is defending its sovereignty and will put all these other countries in their place, uh, does, it doesn't translate very well abroad. 
So I think that there's a fundamental sort of tension there, and um, I, I'm not sure how they're going to, to resolve that. Yeah, I think it's uh, yeah, one of the things that surprised me was censorship was less about preventing people from knowing things than uh, this, as I mentioned, this idea of guiding public opinion, which is to say that most people in China know about what happened on June 4th, 1989. Uh, it's not that they don't know about what happened on June 4th, 1989, but they've come to believe that what they did was the right thing on June 4th, 1989. And uh, and more than that, they've come, I think, uh, at least young people uh, may say that. And more than that, they become extremely sort of a reflect a reflexive about any Western criticism, similar to, I think, to some degree, people in India. And I think it's a global trend where you feel that people outside your country don't have a right to talk about what's happening in your country. Um, and I think that, uh, as you said very rightly, it's not so difficult for people who want to skirt the internet restrictions to do so. Uh, you can buy a VPN. There are many free VPNs as well that give you an IP address outside of China. Um, but I think the more interesting question to ask is why, I think a, a great example is Chinese students who go live abroad. Uh, and there's been lots of studies that kind of tell you that I think uh, Chinese students who go and live abroad and are open to all this kind of information, actually, when they come back, they, many many of them end up being more patriotic and more nationalistic. Uh, um, and that, I think that happens with a lot of diaspora, uh, perhaps with Indian students as well, uh, that you see your home in a different way when you're not living at your home. So, so it's, it's quite interesting where it's not just about access to information, but about how people deal with that. Uh, but this, I don't know if many of you have followed this uh, recent story, which I've been reporting on, and I found quite interesting, is the story of the Chinese tennis player that I mentioned, uh, Peng Shuai, who was a number one, former world number one in doubles. And on November 2nd, um, as I mentioned, it's an interesting case study where she put this message on Weibo, uh, and uh, it was a message that everyone, many people in China would identify with because it's an open secret that uh, people in power uh, abuse it, uh, that uh, the Me Too movement in China really took off in a big way in 2018. Uh, there were students coming forward talking about their professors who would abuse their positions. There were people working in tech companies talking about a very misogynistic work culture. And, and this is an issue that strikes a chord with everyone in China because it's a real issue. And so they have responded to this by really blanket censorship where for a while you can't search for Peng Shui's name anymore on Chinese sites. Uh, for a while, even searching for tennis was blocked. Uh, because they, this was a very, very senior leader who was in the Politburo Standing Committee. So uh, this is a case where they're they're trying to restrict information. But I think everyone who I know has heard about this because people have uh, been talking about it. They found ways to get around the censorship restrictions. Um, and I, I still think opinion would be divided where on the one hand, people would be supportive of Peng Shui, but on the other hand, it's very easy for them to make this into a China against the world issue. They will say, how dare the WTA and Novak Djokovic and Naomi Osaka and others speak up, speak out about us. So I think, so this is an example of censorship plus guiding opinion, where I think that uh, if it, this international sort of attention continues, I won't be surprised if they later turn this into this whole nationalistic thing, which they did with the NBA. Uh, where they kind of encouraged boycotts at the NBA because you had NBA players who were speaking out about Xinjiang and the human rights abuses in Xinjiang. So, uh, so the so the brief answer to the question would be it's a mix of stopping information, but also increasingly effective ways of kind of mobilizing public opinion uh, in in the way that they want to do so. Uh, I mean, I, this is another, I have two questions for you. Firstly, can you comment on uh, Shui and uh, like, you know, I mean, uh, aspect that, you know, her, uh, uh, public, her public uh, announcement against uh, Chang Kaoli on being sexually harassed was there. And, you know, how does this operate in a state, under Xi Jinping, where we see so much concern? 
and uh, you know, receive the information being decimated. Uh, so, what? So, the, is there a loophole in the uh, entire surveillance or the purpose? The second question is uh, which of the three authors have to be because given we see that media author is one of the key components of the three author strategy. Uh, and increasingly, uh, under the word world warrior, we see all the three components be it psychological warfare, media warfare, and legal warfare all coming together. Has this three model strategy, uh, has it been successful in China's or other social things, uh, you know, win without fighting strategy? So, uh, my two questions to you. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a, uh, they, I think there are loopholes, and in Peng Shui's case, I think the reason why the, the message was able to go is because, uh, you know, Weibo has this system like Twitter of verified users. Uh, and uh, verified users usually, I think that uh, from my understanding, when verified users post things, verified users are people that are approved by Weibo. So usually they are they are unlikely to be the people who are going to say things that are going to upset the regime. It's popular, it's Chinese party media, it's some officials, it's government ministries, it's celebrities, actors. And 99.99% of messages from public figures in China they're called big V's. V is verified. So, so 99.9% of messages from these big V's are going to be supporting the party or about very inane thing about entertainment and the like. It's extremely unusual. This might be the first time I think that you've had a big V say something that was so out of what they would expect. I don't think they expected it. I think the fact that she was a top tier Weibo user and the privileges that come with it perhaps allowed her to put that message. Uh, but having having said that, actually the algorithms are quite strict where I know friends who, you know, when you try and put a message on WeChat in Mandarin, it many often, uh, many times when you hit publish, it won't be published. It'll say that there are terms in your message that, uh, that you know, that aren't acceptable and please rephrase your message. It's happened to me several times where I put a harmless message but it may pick up some word like the word could be a republic or the word could be border or the word could be um, it could be Xi Jinping's name uh, in, and it could be a combination of Xi Jinping's name plus another word. There's a very, very sophisticated algorithm. You see, you could say Xi Jinping is a great guy and I mean it would be published. But in your message, suppose you say Xi Jinping is a great guy and five sentences down the line, you're saying something negative about something else. Sometimes the algorithm will tell you, please rephrase your message because it's picked up a combination of his name and, and maybe a not so good phrase. So most of the time, I think it works very well. It's extremely, uh, sometimes when you put harmless messages and it says, please rewrite your message. Um, so I think a lot of it is tech driven. I think in Peng Shui's case, it was an exception because she was a, a well-known public figure. But even in her case, it only lasted 34 minutes. So um, so the message only lasted 34 minutes and after that it was taken down. Uh, but it was quite interesting to see that uh, the China Digital Times, which is a very good resource on Chinese media that's based in Berkeley. So they said that in the 34 minutes that her message was put up, it was only retweeted about a thousand times, but after it was deleted and people and then people became more interested. Why is everyone talking about tennis? Um, and then, so people started using code names uh, to talk about Peng Shui, uh, and people started sharing information using code names to evade the sens sensors. Um, so, uh, for one example that they did was there's a very well known Chinese actor called Eddie Peng. And so people started putting this message in Chinese saying Eddie Peng is handsome because it sounds like saying Peng Shui. Uh, it sounds like her name. So people were doing all these things to evade the sensors and, and to speak about it. And the interest in this case, the searches went up to several million searches after the censorship happened. So I think uh, to put it uh, simply, there are loopholes and now it's going to be difficult for them. You've had Djokovic and top tennis players talk about it. Uh, it's going to be harder for them to, to shut it down. Um, on your other question about how successful it's been, I think it deter I think the answer is like it, it depends what you mean by success. I think domestically, yes, it's successful. I think domestically, the propaganda and info war, as you put it, uh, in terms of whether it's China's border disputes with India, or whether it's South China Sea, whether it's Taiwan, within China, I think what they say is generally successful. And um, I would say most people in China have bought into their narrative on the border clash, which is that India started it and China was defending its sovereignty and India was trying to nibble its territory, uh, which I find quite remarkable because 
um, as I mentioned earlier, it was actually it would be one of the only cases in history where the country that was invading ended up losing territory. But no one in China is actually asking that. Uh, how is it that uh, India invaded, but uh, supposedly India was a transgressor? But people in China have bought that. But I think the 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 other the more difficult question for China is that have people internationally bought that? I would say unequivocally, the answer is no. I think everybody, if you look at the way foreign media has covered it. Uh, I don't think anybody has bought into the domestic media in China's line about how the border clash began. I would say it, it, they haven't failed at all. Uh, even if you look at Taiwan, for example, I don't think that uh, uh, I don't think internationally it's worked very well. So I would say it's successful at home, but not very successful outside of China. Yeah, Gargi, you can ask the question. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Thank you for that insightful lecture. I am Gargi, a second year student at the department. So my question is, uh, Chinese media is basically an echo chamber for domestic audience. So where uh, similar lopsided thoughts keep circulating and they eventually die down. So do you think PRC's propaganda echo chamber will like die a slow death in near future? Because if there's no variety of opinion and discussions, then they'll eventually become blind to their weaknesses, etc. No, thank you for the question. It's a good question. I think that if I try and broaden this beyond China, I think something for us to think about as well, uh, because I do feel that I think media everywhere uh, to some degree even in India or, to, or on social media in India, it is becoming an echo chamber where you hear people uh, retweeting only what they think of. And it's not a it's not a it's not a case where actually you have a debate. I think you see more divisions everywhere. You saw that you've seen that in the US as well. Uh, I think obviously with China, it's a whole other level because you don't even have a debate and divide. It's just about the, the government controlling media in such a huge suffocating way. Um, in terms of how sustainable it is, um, it's hard to say in the sense that it's been how many years? It, it, it's, it's been at least 20 years now in the 2000s where you've had you've had the internet in China. You had you've had people predict for two decades now that uh, the information age and social media would reduce the Communist Party's ability to manage the narrative. I think that so far the evidence has shown that they've used a combination of technology plus nationalism uh, to, to actually use social media to their advantage. I think it's become more of an asset for them than a liability so far because of censorship and the fact that they, they can use it as a, as a way to monitor public opinion as well. Uh, so as of now, I think that they've defied a lot of the expectations people had of how social media would weaken their ability to control information. Uh, but, and I think that that's coupled with the trend I think we're seeing everywhere where um, I think, uh, I mean, I don't want to again generalize because for, for instance in India, I don't know how many of you, I'm just curious, how many of you in this room are daily users of Twitter? Would you raise your hands? Okay, that's quite interesting. So, um, I mean, it's a minority of people in India who used to, I think the percentage is something like 1% of India is, is a regular user of Twitter. So I'd say people on social media tend to become an echo chamber when many of the things that they're talking about uh, and discussing might not matter to most people. For two days now, people are talking about uh, the comedian Veer Das and his uh, monologue, which I don't know how many of you have seen it. But frankly, I don't know. I don't think my parents have a clue. Uh, about who he is or what it matters. I mean, it's a very small demographic that I think is is exercising these things to your point about echo chamber. Uh, but as far as China is concerned, I would say that so far they've defied the the, the predictions of, of people getting tired of it. Um, I think that it's also strange, for instance, on my WeChat feed, when I see what people post, uh, I, I'd say like 99% of things, at least pre-COVID, were about where they were traveling or what they're eating and what they're shopping. And I think that people, I think that kind of dominates uh, what people are sharing, and um, and and so far it seems to be working at least in, in in how the Communist Party has been able to control the narrative in China. Uh, right, uh,
Yeah, uh, so this is a lot of from the uh, Department of Geo Politics. Uh, I want to know from you the essential mistake that chart. Uh, in that chart, you have mentioned about uh, there is a mention of various uh, uh, newspapers and other news media. So, uh, so China Day is not there in that. And uh, one thing which for always I was asking, for always which I wanted to know about was why when there is a China Day, uh, there was a requirement for the minimum managers to come into the picture. Uh, there is no question. My second question is regarding the article which came uh, in the age of the general state on uh, the global movement and who should have taken it to the global is about how the uh, various departments and bureaucracies are trying to harass the media. Uh, that actually sounded a bit strange to me and uh, is there some wonderful event which is happening within the Chinese media industry? And the third question is about the linguistic diversity of Chinese media. Uh, how much is the culture in uh, the ethnic minority languages? I don't know. Uh, can I just repeat? So, your first question, I think, was about China Daily in the Global Times, is that right? Yes. Uh, and I completely missed most of your second question um, because it was really not audible. I, I lost the. Uh, could you just repeat short, quite briefly your, your second question? Yeah, uh, the, my second question is about what article which came, uh, came up in the Global Times written by Bush immediately after this journalist came and where he was mentioning yep. how the Chinese uh, governments and uh, bureaucracies are trying to harass the journalists. And I found, found it a bit you know, off, off the course of what he always talks about. And is there any undercurrent uh, happening there politically in the Chinese media industry? And the third question is about the linguistic diversity of Chinese media. Uh, how much is the content in, let's say, the, the minority languages like uh, Mongol or Tibetan, like that? Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you. Uh, um, so on the China Daily and Global Times, I, so Global Times uh, Chinese edition uh, has always. I'm just going to turn off my video because my line has gotten bad. So the, the Global Times uh, Chinese edition has been a very important paper in, in China for a long time. Um, the English edition was launched, if I remember, must have been in 2009, about the, I think my first year there. And I think the idea then, uh, if I, from what I heard from a couple of the Indians who were working in Global Times, a lot of, of foreign editors there. So what I heard at the time was that the motivations were actually commercial, believe it or not where uh, um, because you only the only newspaper for expats in China was China Daily. So Global Times uh, was was printed as well, the hard copies as well. So initially it was meant for the expats in China. Uh, I think, think more than that now it's evolved into uh, they are published by different ministries is the is the other bureaucratic answer. Uh, China Daily is published by the State Council, which is kind of like their cabinet or uh, like a government department and Global Times is actually not a government paper. It's uh, in the sense that it is published and owned by the People's Daily. So it is actually a party paper. So one's a government paper, one's a party paper. A party paper has more leeway to say things that a government paper has. It's less official. Um, and Global Times English is given more leeway than Global Times Chinese. There's lots of things in Global Times English that are published only to rile up people in India and they're not published in Global Times Chinese. So when I see uh, Indian experts sometimes reacting to it, I feel that they are taking the bait. It's trolling because the articles are not even published in Chinese. Uh, so I, I would give weight to Global Times articles that are published in Chinese, but a lot of the times in English is for eyeballs. People click on it, share it, and then they're making money from it. Um, on the, I, I th the article by the Global Times editor in chief was interesting, where as you said, he said the space for journalists in China is shrinking. I thought it was a unexpected thing for him to say because 
it also seemed to be referring to the fact that the restrictions were growing in the Xi era. But then I think that article has been deleted. Um, he said this in Chinese on Weibo and he also said it in English. And I think that it's been deleted from both. I could be wrong, but the English article is definitely deleted. So I'm not quite sure what happened with that behind the scenes, what the story is that it survived in English. It only survived for a few hours, but then it was taken down from the Global Times website. So I suppose Hu Shijin was given a call from someone and said, listen, take it down. Um, and I think there was another question. What was the third question? Yeah, uh, my third question was about the linguistic uh, diversity. Uh, yes. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I think it, it, it's, I think that it, it, it was a case where uh, you had a trend of increasing diversity, I'd say, starting from the early 2000s, uh, going, going to the Olympic era up until 2012-13. Uh, you had new papers uh, like, I don't know, I would highly recommend if you're interested in China, check out the English language website uh, called Sixth Tone. Uh, Sixth Tone does lots of very interesting stories in English. Uh, the, Ch the Chinese version called The Paper is also an excellent paper. Uh, you've had other magazines like Caixin. Uh, all of these do very good journalism. Uh, Caixin sticks to financial journalism. Uh, obviously, they're things they can't talk about, but they've done great stories on local corruption and, and the like. But I'd say that period of diversity is over. And recently, there was a new regulation said only certain media outlets have the permission to conduct reporting. Um, and I think that more and more you're going to see a trend where the space for having diverse views in the Chinese media is going to shrink. And you're going to have more of the, of, of the party line and everything, mm -hmm. more positive stories, less of the kind of journalism. You saw that excellent Chinese journalists, investigative journalists, but most of them have left journalism and are doing other things uh, for that. And that, that kind of tells you where everything is going. So, I have one more question for you. This is regarding uh, the role of media in politics. First of all, uh, regarding, uh, you know, the right of partners in Pashisipi, which is constantly going. What is the role of the way they uh, change now? Uh, and secondly, uh, you have touched upon the right now, uh, saying that the media does have some good role. But in a recent book by Darren Payton, like how uh, Shinjian, like constitutional Shinjian, he mentions that the like uh, he mentions the incident where the family was clapping and not going to like the Muslim neighbors are being arrested by the police authorities for being suspicious for you know like being Muslims. So uh, he puts it other than that there is a uh, sense of you know greater being greater by the media themselves. So to what extent uh, do you think that is true? Like how is the domestic media like uh, I'm so sorry, could you just repeat that uh, last part about uh, something about Xinjiang, but I could not hear you at all. <coughs> yes, sir. The recent book, you know, it was said that, uh, you know, Han Chinese people were, you know, saying that so or they were in fact supporting how Muslims in Xinjiang were being, you know, the uh, persecuted. So, you know, I mean, the other way of you, this is how they are celebrating the persecution. So, uh, and you also have said that the media is like, doing good journalism in uh, terms of what well, is investigative journalism. But I want to know the news in terms of. Uh, like what is the kind of approach taken by this domestic media towards, you know, the kind of attitude of the government towards people's rights, or it was in the inner Mongolians, or people who are basically not saying this. Yeah, thank you so much. That's gotten clearer now. So I think, yeah, I think that for for instance, in Xinjiang, it's a, I think it's obviously apparent that what they've done uh, since 2016, 2017 uh, is, which has been documented with images and the like, is a construction of a huge network of, uh, you can call them internment centers, internment camps, and they have moved in by some anywhere between several hundreds of thousands of people. We don't really know the exact number. So initially, the initial 
initial response in the Chinese media was to deny it and say it was a fabrication. But when more and more evidence came out, uh, two things happened. And the first thing is uh, you, you started having Chinese state media going to these centers and showing the people there. And they were saying that these were voluntary vocational institutes. And I think it was not a smart thing that they did because you had basically the images that they showed were quite shocking where you would have people who are all wearing this, you know, in the same haircuts in, in classrooms with cameras in them. Uh, not like how all of you are sitting. Everyone was sitting upright in the exact same position with the exact same book on the desk, holding the pens in the exact same way. And uh, there were uh, no windows uh, and it was a it would look more like a prison. So I think the initial, then they what they started doing was to say these are vocational centers, but then they realized that that didn't help. So I think it's a case of now where they have said most of the people who were sent to these camps have now left. They put it as quote unquote they graduated. I think because the international outcry was so high that it forced them to actually move people out, and I think that's true. I think most of the people who were there for two, three years have now left. So the domestic media basically initially ignored it, and then they started saying it was a vocational training center. And where how they were able to, I think, convince people at home is, frankly, most Chinese, as in Han Chinese, have a very sort of poor understanding. I think um, not many of them have lived in Xinjiang or traveled there. I think there's a lot of condescension uh, how minorities are looked at, whether it's Tibetans or Uyghurs. The general party narrative for many years has been that, you know, it was the Communist Party that brought them development, that they were backward minorities and they should be grateful for this kind of development. So that's the kind of narrative. And among actually uh, the majority group, uh, people actually think that uh, the government is too soft on minorities. That's the general view. Because, for example, they don't have to follow family planning for getting into universities, their cutoffs are lower. So it's a, it's a dynamic which uh, which I'm sure which we are familiar with in India, where there is a lot of, uh, you know, because of those policies, people keep saying, oh, they are spoiled, et cetera, et cetera. So there's not very much sympathy uh, for, I, I would say, among Chinese people, there isn't very much sympathy for what's happening in Xinjiang and Tibet. Um, and I think uh, I think that the exception is people I know who've actually traveled there quite a bit and lived there and have seen that and have made friends with people or have married uh, in terms of uh, across ethnic groups. Uh, I think you see you, you you really see much more understanding, but I think that's that's still a very, very small segment of the population. Uh, thank you, Anand. Uh, this brings us uh, to the uh, final stage of the talk today. Uh, I just want to request you that, you know, on the theme of state and media and uh, propaganda and influence, you can give us two uh, key takeaways, final takeaways uh, that uh, for us that, you know, understanding it in the current context. Especially in context sure. of India. Sure, um, I think I lost you for a sec, but I'd say for me, uh, if you can hear me, uh, I would say one thing for us to think about, which I tried to mention uh, a couple of times and highlight, is the tension between uh, what is said domestically, domestic propaganda and external propaganda. I think that's going to be a huge tension going forward for the next five, ten years years that whatever they're saying at home on some level might undermine or make more difficult what they're trying to do abroad in terms of influence. I'd say the second thing worth thinking about, which is I'd say it was more triggered by the question that was asked, is to look at the, the, the difference between uh, uh, how things are put out and how they are consumed, uh, which is which is something to what think about when you read in the papers, China spending X or Y. It's worth thinking about how much of it is really effective, how much of it isn't. Um, and I would also flag the importance of trying to understand nationalism and patriotism as a driver of public opinion in China. Uh, I think a lot of people are asked, uh, there's one question, are they fed up of this echo chamber? Why aren't they reacting against it? I would say think, it, think about it in the way that we sometimes think about external voices criticizing India. Um, I think that's, that's one point I would leave you with is try and put yourself in that position. We're trying to understand public opinion drivers. 
I think there's a lot of uh, sort of resentment against external public criticism, and that in a way is is a big asset for the for the for, for domestic propaganda in China. So I would I would I would leave you with those three things to think about. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as I suppose that you know the it is the war of narratives that is becoming. I think so. Apart from information warfare, this is the field where India and China are uh, engaged. And that's why we have to take cues of you know how we read and whom we read uh, becomes very uh, uh, promising for us. Especially you know in India we see in the context of global times that uh, creates a lot of outrage. But since given your talk, it's how it's interpreted because global times in China is interpreted very differently from that of the English version of global times. So on that note, I would like to thank you for your time and patience and uh, addressing each question with uh, so much deliberation. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, my Shudi for giving me this opportunity to host this talk. And uh, we look forward to having you here uh, at our campus in Manipal whenever you are in India, because uh, I think so. Uh, that would be uh, something that we look forward to, because this is one subject uh, which is uh, not everyone's cup of tea and we can't do justice as you have done. So on that note, uh, I would request all of you to give a huge round of applause. <laughs>